Well, Saturday, June 25th, 2022. Ugh. Hair stuck in my lip gloss. Hair stuck in my lip gloss. So, I'm going to start a new novel today, or start reading a different novel. And this is the third novel that I wrote, and it is entitled Luck of the Draw. Luck of the Draw. I wrote this book in the autumn season of 2020 while California was on fire. I dedicate it to those with the wisdom to keep ancient knowledge and traditions. Chapter 1. More Than She Could Offer. Doug guided Stuart, his giant marmalade-colored cat, into the carrying crate and closed the front latch. Stuart exhaled a half-hearted meow and purred, rubbing his head against the grate of the door as Doug pulled his hand away. What a good boy. When we get to work, you can have some kitty crack and fishy flakes. Doug checked his bag to be sure the new jar of catnip was in there. It was. With some actual effort, he picked up the crate with the ample cat, slung his bag over his, his other shoulder, and swiped his keys from the kitchen table. Saturdays were usually his day to hike shoreline or have lunch with Galena, his late mother's best friend, but Galena had called earlier in the week to say she was taking a weekend trip with a gentleman friend, and Doug hadn't asked any questions. He was more than happy to be off the hook. His mother had been one of twelve children, but his actual aunt and uncles had never left Ukraine. He had only met them once or twice in his entire life, and that was before he had even shaved for the first time. Galena and his mother immigrated around the same time and met while doing temp work for a small agency before Anya had met Doug's father, Dennis. Anya and Galena were fast friends and had even been roommates until Dennis bought a ring. Doug now had that ring in a box in the back of his kitchen junk drawer. Eberly, his boyfriend of the past six years, thought the ring was ugly. But Doug had no intentions of ever asking Eberly to marry him, no matter what the law now said he could do. It's just going to be you and me at the office today, stew pie. Daddy has some paperwork to catch up on, Doug explained to the cat as he secured the crate to the front passenger seat of, the second, of his second-hand escape. Stuart just meowed apathetically. Well, don't sound so excited. It's not like I enjoy this part either. It's just, well, Daddy's a sucker, stew poo. Crazy people don't know how to fill out paperwork. Doug never brought his files home. He had a strict personal policy about separation of work and home. The two were, were never to meet. He was seriously concerned that the crazy might rub off on him if he let any of, anything of his clients touch anything of his life outside the office. One time a couple years ago, he unexpectedly ran into a client at El Rio in the city. It was, it was Cinco de Mayo. He and Eberly had been drinking and were dancing suggestively to a, to a cross-dressing mariachi band when he was shaken from their sloppy, sweaty bubble to the sound of someone yelling, Dr. Spears! Dr. Spears! A young trans girl was flagging him with a lipstick-stained hanky from across the back courtyard. Doug had grabbed Eberly by the shoulder and pulled him out through the neighbor, neighboring punk club without explanation. Once on the street, he ran, almost dragging poor Eberly on the pavement, until they were three blocks away and around the corner looking for a cab. It wasn't that Doug was trying to hide that he was gay. He just thought the majority of the LGBTQ community was crazy and wanted nothing to do with them unless they were sucking his dick or paying him to fix their broken minds. He had made Eberly submit to a barrage of psychological evaluations before he would invite him to come in for a drink. Everly had only humored him because the blowjob in the truck stop restroom where they had met had been so good. Neither man had been with another man since that first fateful meeting, and neither had been back to any Bay Area club since the El Rio incident. They kept their social activities limited mostly to each other, Stuart, Micah, Everly's cat, Galena, or Stephanie and Jack, Everly's favorite niece and her husband. Everly did freelance copy editing for a couple technical magazines and rarely had to meet with co-workers face to face. Three times a year, the two men took trips together to go antiquing in British Columbia, New England, or along the Mendocino coast. 
Once a year, Doug took a week to travel alone, usually to a silent retreat center or a professional conference. For that week, Everly brought Micah over to Doug's and stayed, mostly because Doug had a lot of houseplants that needed care, but also because Doug liked a good fuck as soon as he got home, and Everly was, hap was, happy, was a happily obliging bottom. When the two men traveled together, Stephanie took care of the cats and the plants. Doug knew nothing about Stephanie's sex life and didn't care to. Jack was fat, and Doug couldn't imagine his dick was long enough to reach out from under his belly to pee standing up, let alone reach anyone's vagina. It was a quarter after one as Doug pulled into his parking space behind the office building. With any luck, he was there in time to see Dee Dee arrive, the crusty old faggot who, who was what's-her-face Amy's regular Saturday client. Dee Dee was a well-known fixture in the local gay community. He had survived SF in the 70s and 80s without getting HIV and without using condoms. Dee Dee was known to flaunt his horrendous, this horrendous fact openly and claimed his ability to avoid having, having the HIV was wrapped up in always knowing the right astrologer to read his palm or some such nonsense. Doug wasn't sure exactly what Amy did out of her office, but he did know. He, he had a number of regular clients because of her referrals, and she didn't seem to care that he didn't reciprocate. After the last couple referrals, she sent his way, however. He was reconsidering the arrangement. Maybe it was time to repay the favor, so to speak. Over the years, he had a couple clients that became something of a stalker, but they had all been easily taken care of with the threat of a restraining order. But about six months back, Amy referred a trans guy, Alex, to Doug. Alex told Doug that Amy had no idea he was trans, and, and Doug believed it. Alex had none of the physical telltale signs. Alex looked 100% natural unless you got his pants off. Then the lack of outdoor plumbing gave things away. Doug only knew this detail because Alex had bragged about it at their first session. Alex became convinced Doug needed a real man in his life and began following him around and leaving messages on his voicemail daily. When Doug turned down Alex's advances, he had broken in and left six dead rats at the back door of his office, or rather, Doug thought Alex did it. After the rat incident, Doug had called Alex and referred him to another therapist, a friend from college who specialized in people going through gender transition. Alex hadn't taken it well, and Doug caught him trying to break in with a bobby pin recently. Alex had been arrested, but what Doug didn't know yet was Alex truly had nothing to do with the rats. Stuart knew they were getting close to the office and began to meow excitedly as Doug parked the escape. Doug heaved the cat in his carrier out of the vehicle and shut the door using his right foot, then clicked the doors locked with his fob. He saw Amy's car and Maggie's banged-up mint-green moped parked opposite his space. There was only one car in the client lot out front when he pulled in, so he was excited at the prospect of seeing Dee Dee arrive and what ridiculous get-up he was wearing. Dee Dee was a very masculine-looking man, but he insisted on, on dressing like a menopausal hippie woman in flowing caftans, scarves, hoop earrings, and the like. The bald patch on top of his head shone as if he buffed it with floor wax, and it was not unusual to see him with pink foam rollers securing all the stringy fluff circling the gleaming friar's patch. Seeing the spectacle of Dee Dee was the only thing that made a Saturday afternoon of insurance paperwork worth it. Doug believed himself above such displays of faggotry, and gathered himself and, and scurried up the back stairwell to the back door of his office. Stuart meowed in anticipation of catnip and bonito flakes. Doug sat the carrier on the floor inside the door and opened the latch to let Stuart out into the, par into the sparsely decorated office. Stuart, no scarf and barf, okay, buddy? I'm going to give you some fishy flakes here in your bowl, and, and then I'll put the crack on your beddy bed, okay? Stuart meowed loudly and wrapped himself back and forth around Doug's feet as he hung his bag on the hook on the back of the door and fluffed the heated kitty cushion in the basket hanging from the window sill. Damn it, Stupai, you're going to trip me. If I break my neck, who's going to give you crack and flakes? Stuart sat and looked at Doug thoughtfully as he placed a generous pinch of bonito flakes in a small dish and sprinkled catnip straight from the jar onto the cushion. Stuart darted to the bonito flakes as Doug flipped the light switch on the wall. Then he picked up a tiny remote and turned on the surround system. The sound of ocean waves crashed in the room as if they were out at Bodega Bay and not in the stuffy little Mountain View office. Doug grabbed the stack of files from the past week from a tray on the shelf behind his desk and stacked in, and stack of insurance forms from a shelf on the opposite side of the room and flopped into his overstuffed chair. The clock on the wall above the front door flashed 128, 
Stuart licked Benito Flakes from his whiskers and proceeded to have a small freak-out, running in circles, then darted out the cat door Doug had installed in the front door. Dee Dee must be here, Doug said out loud, and stood up to peek between the blinds. As he moved past his desk, he knocked the book of IDC 9 codes on the floor and bent over to pick it up. As he stood up, Stuart ran back in the office and out the cat door installed in the back door. Crazy cat! You haven't even touched the kitty crack yet, he called after Stuart. Then, using his right index and middle fingers, he pulled open the blinds just enough to look out onto the parking lot. A car had just pulled in, but it wasn't Dee Dee in his purple dragon art car. It was a black Ford or Mercedes with tinted windows. Two men got out of the front. Well, Amy's clientele is coming up these days, he said to no one as the two men mounted the stairs. But they didn't pass Doug's door. Instead, the one who had been driving knocked. Doug pulled his fingers from the blinds and held his breath. The sound of the ocean waves crashed over him as if he were drowning. He didn't know why, but all of a sudden he was frightened, and the room felt too hot and too small. He was glad Stuart had run off. The driver knocked again. Hey, we know you're in there. I saw you looking out through the blinds, and we can hear the radio on in there, man. Open the door, and we can be done with this fast and easy, one of the men said from the other side of the door. Doug was frozen. He didn't know what to do or say. He didn't know who these men were or why they were knocking on his door. I'm with a client. Please take a card and call to make an appointment. Doug had a business card holder mounted just to the right of his door. Most of the offices on, in the building did. Look, man, we know you're in there alone. Now open the door. I just want to have a conversation, one of the men said. Hey, I get it, but I only have conversations by appointment and with a referral, Doug replied. Hey. Put your faggoty face up to the window for a second. Doug pulled his blinds open, as he had before when he was hoping to spy Dee Dee in a moo-moo. One of the men held a pistol up to the glass. Doug let the blinds snap back together. Now open the door, or we'll shoot it open. We don't want to have to do that. We just want to talk. Got it? Doug opened the door reluctantly, and the two men pushed in and passed him, the gun now holstered. Doug wasn't sure which one was hold, holding it or if they both were carrying. How'd you know I'd be here? I don't usually keep Saturday hours, he asked bravely. We didn't know. We just got lucky. We're not really here to see you today anyway, but it's lucky. Maybe we can take care of two birds with one, you know, the man who had been driving said while looking around the sparsely filled room. No, I don't know. Who are you and what do you want from me? The man who had been in the passenger seat looked at Doug in intently before he spoke. His houndstooth blazer was well-tailored. His jeans were expensive, and the fine-gauge silk v-neck pullover was in good taste. Doug noticed he wasn't wearing any socks with his Prada loafers. Doug had a pair of the same loafers and faux crocodile, but this man's were classic black, very L.A., or Berlin, or New York, or anywhere but Mountain View. You know Casey Ann Rosanova? It was a statement, not a question. In fact, Doug did know Casey. She was a relatively new client referred to him by Amy. I can neither confirm or deny any patients. I'm a licensed medical professional, you understand, Doug said carefully. The man looked unimpressed. The other man, the one who had been driving, started to feign, thumbing through a stack of client paperwork on a shelf. Doug saw the holster under his charcoal gray blazer. It wasn't a question. She's my... The man stumbled on his words for a moment. Doug couldn't quite tell if he was looking for the right word to use because he hadn't thought things through or because English was not his first language. Doug thought he detected some faint accent, but couldn't be sure. My kin, and I understand she has been coming to see you once a week to talk about her private life. What do you know about Amaranth Gonder? The man finished, running his index and middle fingers over the edge of Doug's desk. Then he rubbed the dust to his thumb and inspected his fingers. They were clean. Doug had a cleaning service that came in early Saturday mornings. He paid them to do the shared bathrooms, too. Doug swallowed before answering the question. He wasn't sure whether he should be relieved or more alarmed. Amaranth Gonder? Not much. She has an office down the hall and sometimes refers clients to me. Doug stuttered nervously. Down the hall, huh? Refers clients to you sometimes, like... How many times? Like, for how long? The man now ran his right hand over the right lapel of his blazer and inhaled sharply without making any expression with his face. 
Doug looked over to the driver who was leaning on the bookcase with one elbow and the knee of his opposite leg bent, resting the ball of the foot of his bent leg on the top of the foot of his straight leg. The gun, <coughs> the gun could be seen poking out from below his blazer. Doug looked back to the other man. Um, yeah, like maybe six or seven clients over the past four years, Doug offered, turning his cheek toward the man in front of him. The man looked satisfied with Doug's answer, but still had questions. Four years? She has been there, she been here that long? Doug was a little surprised. Amy had never given him any reason to think she had anything to do with the unsavory type of individual standing in front of him right now, in case he was a little odd, but all of his clients were. He wondered what this guy meant by the term kin. Casey said her parents lived back east and her biggest problem seemed to be homesickness as far as Doug had seen so far, but he'd only met with her three times. It was hardly enough time to figure, a hu figure out a human being, particularly one voluntarily seeking therapy. But Amy, wow, Doug wasn't ever interested in having his cards read, but... He understood why other people did. Really, the job Amy did wasn't much different than his, and their clients had many similar issues and concerns. The truth was, Doug respected Amy for knowing when people needed professional help and not just something vague to get by. At least, at least, but I don't know exactly how long she's been here. I've been here four years, and she was here before me. This wasn't entirely true. Doug knew Amy had been there four and a half years because when they met for the first time... The day he moved his stuff into the office, she told him she had been there for six months so far and really liked it. A couple days after that, they had chatted over lunch in the shared kitchen. After that, Amy started referring clients that needed more than she could offer, as she explained it to Doug. The man bought it, turning down the corners of his mouth, nodding his head up and down slightly. All right, now tell me everything you know about her and her clients and her business right now, and, and if I think you're lying to me, I'll go find your cat and kill him. I trust he enjoyed the rats we left for him last week. The man spoke without blinking or moving his eyes from Doug, even as he moved towards the chair where Doug's clients usually sat during session. Feel free to sit down. I'm willing to wait as long as it takes to hear what you know, the man said, smoothing his hands over his pant legs before crossing his right ankle to his left knee. Doug saw a small inscription-style tattoo on the inside of the man's ankle, but didn't recognize the language it was, it was written in. He stumbled backward, nearly tripping, looking for his chair. He found it and sat down, grabbing the armrests uh, first. Um, I don't really know much at all. We see each other in the kitchen from time to time, and one time we had a drink together at the whitewash, but I don't even know where she lives other than to say somewhere nearby. Come now, Mr. Spears. You are a clinical psychologist, sir. Are you asking me to believe that you have absolutely no other knowledge... Or understanding of Miss Gonder. The man chuckled lightly. The driver echoed the chuckle. Doug was becoming increasingly nervous and passed gas. At this, the other two men broke out in hilarious laughter. Once they settled themselves, the man opposite Doug in the chair continued. But seriously now, Mr. Spears, what else can you tell me about darling Amy? Doug spent the next half an hour going over in minutia every conversation he had ever had with Amy that he could remember. None of it was anything that was much interesting. She likes chocolate-covered orange candies but hates marshmallow, keeps office hours Monday through Saturday but only by appointment, reads tarot and practices some New Age therapy or some such thing called Reiki, not married, no kids, no family he knew of, likes live music, fancy cheeses, and, and dry rosé wine. She referred Casey to him a month ago for therapy because she thought the girl was homesick and needed to deal with growing up, not get her cards read every week. Doug said he agreed with her assessment. Finally, Stuart came back in through the back door and broke the awkward energy in the room, rubbing up against Doug's legs before jumping up in the strange man's lap, then into the, to the catnip-lined basket in the window and, and settling down to lick himself. The man wiped invisible cat fur from his lap and stood up, seemingly satisfied with what Doug had told him about Amy. Well, Mr. Spears, now I would like you to suck my dick, he said as simply as if he had just said, nice to meet you. Doug instinctively got on his knees, scared for his life. He'd had his dick sucked by strangers and sucked enough strangers' dicks in truck stops 
that this was really only a mild violation as far as those things go. Besides, the sky was very well manicured. He would have turned Doug's head had they crossed paths at the club. The man laughed and smacked him lightly on his cheek with his open palm. Fuck you. I don't actually want you to suck my dick. I just wanted to see if you would. With that, the man motioned to the driver of the car, and the two men left out the front door, heading towards Amy's office. Doug scooped up Stuart in his bag quickly, locked the front door, and left out the back the way he had come in. He didn't know what they wanted with Amy, but he didn't want to stick around to find out, either. Stuart meowed softly, placated by catnip and whatever mischief he had gotten into in the hallway. Chapter 2 More Interesting Than Living more interesting than the living, nine times out of ten. Amaranth heard someone quickly walk down the back hall as she checked the clock on the wall behind her one more time. Her 2 p.m. was over 35 minutes late, and this was the second time. Against her better judgment, she had let him off the hook the first time without any charge. She knew he had been lying to her about his excuse. It was kind of a big part of her business to know when people were being dishonest. However, she regrettably had made the exception because of who Mike was rumored to be. Now she was angry. She had rearranged the entire calendar to accommodate Mike's requested date for rescheduling his appointment. One of her most regular clients had given up their long-standing time slot to suit this entitled prick, and now he was nowhere to be seen. It was a good thing Amaranth, or Amy as her friends called her, had enforced her reservation policy and required Mike give her a credit card when scheduling slash rescheduling. She got up and crossed the small but comfortable room and locked the door. Then she pulled out the point-of-sale accounting program on her, ta on her tablet, punched in the credit card number, and charged the full amount, $350. As the screen popped up approved, someone attempted to open the front door and enter the office. Amy was still for a moment. She looked over her shoulder and saw the door to the back hallway that connected to the kitchen and restroom shared by the other offices on her floor was also bolted. She relaxed a bit and settled her focus on the front door, still being lightly shaken by the knob from the outside. Now a knock came. Five or six hard raps in quick succession. Hey, you in there? A man's voice said in an annoyed fashion. I have an appointment. Amy pulled up the app for the doorbell camera she installed a few months back when packages were being stolen. It was him. It was Mike, and he had another man with him, which was also not part of the agreement. When Jonas introduced Mike to Amy at the whitewash a couple weeks back, she explained her services were by appointment only, a minimum of 45 minutes, non-transferable, private, confidential, one-on-one, -on -one, with a strict 48-hour cancellation policy. The other guy, standing just behind Mike at the door, stuffed a set of keys in his pocket, shifted his weight uneasily from side to side, and looked either way down the exterior hallway. It was Saturday, and the only other person who was regularly in their office on her floor was Maggie down the hall. Maggie's office was sound insulated. The landlord had split the cost of the insulation with Maggie after everyone complained about the sounds coming from her space. Maggie practiced a form of past-life regression therapy that involved high-pitched bells and making or mimicking guttural animal-like noises. Her clients enthusiastically swore by its effectiveness, but Amy was skeptical. She knew Maggie had at one time desired to be a professional singer, but was told she was, tone deaf, was a tone-deaf harpy. Amy agreed with the assessment and surmised Maggie, Maggie gained satisfaction from making noise. All the past life stories she heard from the clients she had spoken with were versions of a similar story, and it just wasn't reasonable to Amy that every single client that came to see Maggie was once a prince or princess. Maggie insisted it was simply her karmic job to care for royals who were re-embodied in this life as commoners. Amy didn't argue with her. Lots of folks believed her line of work to be mumbo-jumbo as well, but Amy never sent, sent any business Maggie's way though she did sometimes refer folks to Doug Spears, the clinical psychologist in private practice at the other end of the hall. Amy now watched as Mike's friend pushed past him and impatiently pounded on the door. She couldn't tell for sure, but it looked as if he had a holster under his jacket with a sidearm. Not today, Amy thought to herself as she quickly and quietly stood up, put her cards, tablet, cell phone, and client appointment book in her oversized purse, unlatched the bolt on the back door, and slipped out, locking the door behind her. As she reached the stairwell at the end of the interior hallway, she heard her door busted down and glass shatter. Keys in hand, she ran down the stairs and burst into the back parking lot. Without fumbling, she clicked the fob and unlocked the doors of her Elantra parked just a few spots from the stairwell. 
As she pulled around the front of the building, she could see the door to her office was hanging open, and the two men had busted things up inside. The glass shelves with her stones and small chihuly bowl given to her by a former client could, could usually be seen sparkling through the window above her door from the front parking lot, and right now they were nowhere to be seen. Amy's heart sank. The bowl was insured, but it was totally irreplaceable. The two men were not in sight. They must have gone out the back door looking for her. Amy pulled out of the parking lot and onto the street. As far as she knew, Mike didn't know what she drove, but if he, if he was who he was rumored to be, and today's events seemed to indicate that was the case, he'd have no problem tracking her down. The real question was what did he want with her? It's not like they had anything in common other than drinking at the whitewash, and Amy couldn't say she had ever even seen Mike there before that night Jonas introduced them. Amy made a note to herself not to break any more of her professional rules about accepting new clients and to never trust Jonas ever again. It's not like she even really knew him. He was just the bartender, and she had only just told him what she did for work that night. Mercury must have been retrograde. That was the only way Amy could explain why she had given in and told Jonas what she did for a living or why she had let him introduce her to anyone as a potential client. Better yet, she thought, she'd just find a new bar. The whitewash had been attracting a strange group of folks lately, and the live music had taken a turn for the worse for a couple months now, and that was why she had starting, started going there to begin with, the music. Amy pulled into a gas station and parked the car in a corner space near the near the air near the compressed air without turning off the engine she pulled out her phone and pulled up the address for the nearest police station she was starting to wonder if the whole thing with jonas and mike hadn't been set up from the start most women in amy's line of work kept offices with lots of cheesy neon lights and signs flashing in the window most women in amy's line of work were also beholden to a big man and paid dues to operate those women's work was always compromised the big man always wanted to know who was coming, why, what they were asking, and how much they paid. Then he would want his cut. Amy wasn't interested in such an arrangement. She didn't have any, any garish signs. Her office was very professional. Her clients were private. Her fees reasonable, and all by word of mouth. She was also a certified Reiki master teacher, so that was what was listed if anyone bothered to look her up. But she also read tarot, did energy balancing, mediumship work, and space clearing. Reiki was only about a quarter of her business, if that. Most of her clients came to her either for tarot or mediumship. Old houses were restless, however. Old houses were restless, however, but Amy did, didn't mind doing house calls from time to time as well. The dead were much more interesting than the living, nine times out of ten. Normally, Amy wouldn't have bothered with the police, but she anticipated the insurance company was going to want a police report, and that bull was worth nearly half a million dollars. She almost shit her pants when she had, had it appraised for a policy. Mrs. Bunty had been very appreciative of Amy's help finding her lost Pomeranian. Dog people could be strange, but Amy certainly was never one to look a gift horse in the mouth, and the bull was very pretty. The police station was just over a mile and a half away. Amy liked... Well, Amy liked her office and hoped she wasn't going to have to move to a new location, but something told her she wasn't going to be so lucky. She set up her GPS to head to the police station, but decided to pull a card before backing out of the parking space. She removed the deck from the satin pouch that held the cards and, and shuffled lightly before turning up the top card. It was the hanged man. She laughed to herself. I guess that's what I get for not following my own rules, she thought. But then again, this could be any of these three men. Mike... He had, he had betrayed her by not showing up the first time, then showing up late the second time with a friend. Mike's friend. He might have betrayed Mike by breaking down the door. Or Jonas. Jonas sure felt like a traitor to Amy personally at this moment. Amy replaced the cards in, in their satin pouch and tucked the pouch in her bag before backing out of the spot and pulling back out onto the street. The sun was shining off the windows of the stores to Amy's right and as she headed north. The sparkle reminded her of the bowl that used to sit in her office window. A short woman in plain clothes with dyed black shoulder-length hair and a stark white and stark white two-inch roots was seated behind the shabby desk in the center of the police station lobby. Other than the white roots of her hair and the lines of her hands, this woman looked no older than, than 30. 
She smiled at Amy as she approached the desk. Other than the two women, the lobby was deserted. As Amy rested her hands on the edge of the desk, the woman inquired, how can I help you? Until this moment, Amy hadn't realized just how scared she was by the unfold unfolding events. Her heart, heart pounded in her throat and tears welled up under the bottom lids. But she held them in as she answered, My name is Amaranth Danielle Gonder. I keep an office a couple miles from here. It was just broken into and vandalized by two men, Amy explained. Oh my, that's terrible. Are they still there? I have no idea. I'm here. Well, how do you know the office was broken into? Because I was there. Do you know who did it? Sort of. I know who one of the men is. He, he was a client, or rather a new client. Um, okay. Please have a seat, and I will see if an officer is available to speak to you. Available to speak to me? I think these men meant me harm. Is someone going to take a report? Ma'am, I need you to be patient and take a seat. I don't know if there is, is currently an officer here to speak to you. The woman picked up the phone and dialed a number, seemingly pleased with herself. Amy watched her for a moment before taking a seat as she was asked to do. After ten minutes or so, a short, male, uniformed officer came around the corner with a clipboard and a pen by, by his side in his left hand. Amaranth Goner? He asked Amy. Um, it's Gonder, not Goner. Yes, I'm Amaranth. You may call me Amy, she said as she stood up to greet the policeman. At 5'8", she was at least six inches taller than the man. Seemingly unaware of the disparity, the officer tipped his chin up to meet her eyes before speaking. Hello, Amy. I'm Officer Juno. Please tell me what happened. Amy folded her arms across her chest and rolled her head to the right as she exhaled and stared off into space a bit as she began her tale. Looking down at the man made her uncomfortable, as if she were speaking to one of her cousin's kids. Well, I had a client scheduled for today at two. Normally, I have a regular client on Saturdays from 1.30 to 3, and then I go home, but today was a new client. He was originally supposed to meet with me Monday last week, but had a last-minute emergency come up, so we were scheduled. Amy paused to give, the officer, to give Officer Juno time to finish his notes before she continued. Anyway, he was over half an hour late, and I have a 48-hour cancellation policy. Since this was his second time, I was pretty irritated and had just run the credit card on file for the full cost of the appointment when he showed up and tried to get in the office. I had locked the door already because I was getting ready to leave, so he couldn't just come right in. He had another man with him. I know because I have a camera at the door and could see them. The other man pushed past my client and pounded on the door. Officer Juno con continued to take notes and didn't even look up at Amy as he asked, did they know you were in the office? I don't know. I, I didn't make any sound, and the front window is eye level, but I cover it with, with mini blinds and a curtain for privacy when I moved in. What type of work do you do, ma'am? What was the appointment for? Juno asked, again, without looking up at Amy. Um, well, I'm a Reiki master teacher, and I also read cards. This was an appointment for a card reading. Reiki? What's that? The officer asked, now looking at Amy with a furrowed brow. Well, it's kind of like acupressure, but not exactly. It's a holistic practice from Japan, but it doesn't matter. He was coming to he was coming to have me read his cards. At least that's what he said when he made the appointment both times. And you weren't expecting two people for the appointment? Absolutely not, Amy answered quickly. It's my policy that all appointments are private one-on-one -on -one sessions. He knew this. <laughs> okay, ma'am, it's it's okay. Take a breath. I'm fine. It's just upsetting. I understand. Now what happened next? Well, once they started shaking the door, I gathered my things and slipped out the back. What do you mean, the back? My office is over in one of those two-story office strip buildings off Castro. There are 16 offices in my building, eight on the bottom floor and eight on my floor. Each one has its own front entrance, and each one has a door in the back to an interior hallway where we have a shared kitchen and restrooms and a stairwell down to a small parking lot for the renters. There's another big, bigger parking lot in the front for the, for the clients. I see. So they probably didn't know about the back door at the end then? I don't know, Amy answered. How do you know they broke in? Because I heard it as I was going down the stairs to my car, and I could see as I pulled around the front of the parking lot to come here. Oh, I see. Okay, well, I think I'd like to go over there and check it out. What's the, what's the client's name? Mike. Michael Musgraves. The officer stopped and looked at Amy intently for a second before he spoke. Mike Musgraves? The loan shark? I have no idea what he does for a living. I only recently was introduced to him. You better not be lying about this, Amy. Amy was offended. You think I have nothing better to do with my time than make false accusations about gangsters to the police? You think that would be wise in my line of work? 
I'm just saying, but since you brought it up, what house do you report to? Amy's nostrils flared, unable to hide her irritation at the assumption about her and her work. To myself and my God, I am not part of any criminal stable. Of course not, ma'am, Officer Juno said with a tinge of sarcasm not lost on Amy. If you give me the address, we can head over there right now. And what if they're still there, Amy asked. Then I'll arrest them. You said there's a camera, right? Yeah, there's a camera. Well, then, whether they're, they are there or not, you'll be able to show me who did what. Amy sighed and gave the officer the address. Then they both headed to the parking lot. As she pulled back into the lot in front of, the, in front of her office, Amy saw Officer Juno was already there. A small, a small crowd was gathered in front of her office door. Amy could see Maggie standing with her feet widespread and her fists on her hips, straining her neck to look into Amy's space. Officer Juno was walking up the stairs. Amy parked her car next to the police cruiser and went to grab her bag from the passenger side seat. The satin pouch slid out of her purse. The pouch opened and four cards fell out of the deck and onto the seat face up. Five of cups, seven of swords, the empress, and the fool. No shit, Amy exclaimed out loud. I don't need you to tell me that, she told the cards, as she put them back in their pouch and stuffed the pouch in her purse. As Amy approached the small gathering of people in front of her office, Officer Juno was taking everyone's name and trying to herd them away from the door. Amy could see one of the hinges had been pulled out of the door entirely and everything was on the floor. The whole office had been tossed, but why? Whoever M Mike Musgraves was or wasn't, Amy hadn't had anything to do with him before this unfortunate string of events, and she certainly had never seen the other man who had been with him. Amy didn't gamble, not even pretzel sticks and peanuts with her dad and brother playing rummy growing up. Gambling was a fool's game, and Amy was nobody's fool. Maggie came running in Amy's direction as she reached the top of the stairs. Oh, Amy, I'm so glad you're all right. Did you see your office? Amy just stared at Maggie, who abruptly shut up and backed away from her. The other people gathered around were Maggie's clients and Tubbs, the building maintenance man. Amy didn't recognize Tubbs at first because he didn't usually work on Saturdays and wasn't wearing his coveralls. Instead, he was wearing dark blue creased jeans with a button-down Oxford cardigan and loafers. Officer, Officer Juno said something to Maggie, who thanked him and nodded and headed back to her office with her two clients, while Tubbs stayed and talked with Amy and Officer Juno. Officer Juno looked at Amy with a hard stare, and you have no idea what they were looking for. He questioned her as if he didn't believe her at all. Amy was shocked. No idea at all. I told you. I had only recently been introduced to Mr. Musgraves, and this would have been his first appointment. And probably his last, Tubbs quipped, looking at all the damage in the space. Amy surveyed the room. All her books were knocked off the shelves. The ficus was toppled and dirt was all over the floor. The Bose radio was on the floor, and there, and as were all her stones and her desk lamp. The Chihuly bowl, however, was sitting unbroken in the center of the table that also served as her desk. She approached the bowl and picked it up gingerly, turning it over in her hands. I can't believe it, she said. Believe what? Officer Juno asked. That this isn't broken. Well, maybe they just didn't get to pushing it, pushing it on the floor, Juno replied. Tubbs laughed. He, he knew about the bowl because he had helped Amy install the shelf in the window above the door where it usually sat. What's so funny? Juno said to Tubbs, who instantly clammed up. Oh, he knows that, what the bowl is and that it doesn't sit on this table. Oh, is that so? Yes, this happens to be a Dale Chihuly original and sits on that shelf up there above the, above the door. Amy pointed to the now broken glass shelf in the half round window. Put that down immediately. It might have usable prints. Excuse me. Officer Juno stepped out of the office, leaving Amy and Tubbs staring at each other over the ridiculously expensive glass bowl. We got most of it on tape, Tubbs told Amy. Huh? What do you mean? I've got a camera on my door out there, but not in here. Yeah, I know. Mr. Shoup had me install cameras on either end of the interior hallway just last week. He was watching when they were here. He's the one who called me and asked me to come and check things out. What? I wasn't told that. That's not in the lease. Yeah, I know, but now he's going to tell everyone about them. I'm supposed to deliver a letter on Monday morning to all the units in the building, Tubbs replied in a matter-of-fact manner. Amy was feeling violated on many levels. Why the cameras? And why weren't we told beforehand? Tubbs sighed and shrugged. I don't know. Doug had a weirdo last month giving him death threats, and he left some dead animals in the back hallway in front of Doug's door, but we didn't have any hard proof, so Shoop told me to put in the cameras. I'm surprised you didn't notice them already. It's not like they're hidden. 
Oh, well, I guess that's okay. Amy remembered seeing the dead rats in front of Doug's door, but thought maybe the cat had brought them in. Sometimes Doug brought his cat, Stuart, into the office and was, going, and was going to be working late on paperwork. Doug was one of the few specialists Amy knew who still submitted to insurance on behalf of his clients. Stuart was known to patrol the back hall and kitchen in, in search of treats. He, he really was an agreeable animal. Amy had no idea about Doug's goofy client. Doug was very professional and never talked about his clients to others, unlike Maggie. Is Doug okay? Doug? Oh my God, yeah. He caught the guy trying to pick the front lock at the, and the goofball was arrested. Doug paid for one of the cameras in the hallway back there. Officer Juno entered the space, tucking his phone in his pocket. Well, Amy, is there anything missing? Amy was taken off guard. She hadn't even thought to look. Um, I don't know. Let me look. The only thing really worth taking would have been that bowl. She pointed to the chihuly piece now sitting back on the table, but started to take a closer inventory of the items now strewn about the room. No, everything looks like it's here, but I'm definitely going to do a serious clearing. The energy in here is just terrible. Yeah, your feng shui must, all, must be all messed up, Officer Juno chided in an insulting tone. Look, no one said you need to believe in what I do for work, but I'm a professional and people do pay me for my services. The rent in this place isn't free. Far from it. This was no lie. Amy's office had parking and was situated off the main strip near the, near the train station. The rent for her office was three times per square foot what her tiny apartment was just five miles away. And that wasn't cheap either. Juno rolled his eyes and Tubbs disappeared into the back hallway, then reappeared with a toolbox and started to rehang and secure the front door while Amy and Officer Juno continued to talk. Look, Mrs. Gonder, Miss, not Mrs., whatever, Miss Gonder, you never had any interaction with Mr. Musgraves before today? Only when we met and scheduling and rescheduling his appointment. And where did you meet Mr. Musgraves? At the whitewash. The whitewash? Do you work there too, I suppose? Now Amy was ready to lose her patience with this cop. Hardly. I've been going there a couple times a week for the past five years, Tuesday and Friday nights. I like the live music, and they have decent wine and appetizers. I see. And do you meet clients there frequently? Never. This was the first time. I don't even tell people what I do for work. Well, how did Mr. Musgraves find out? Amy felt like she was being accused of something and resented it. Jonas, the bartender, had been asking me for the past few months what I did about what I did for work. I wouldn't tell him because you have no idea how people can be about my line of work, and I didn't feel like being harassed and hassled by drunks and strangers. But a few weeks ago, it was slow, and we were just joking around. The band was late. I told Jonas that if the band didn't show up, I'd tell him what, he did, what I did for work. The band always shows up, and I just wanted him to leave me alone. But guess what? The band didn't show up, and so I had to tell him what I did. Next thing I know, he's calling some guy over to the bar from a corner booth and telling him that I was some big-time madam and wanted to read his cards for him. It was this guy, Mike Musgraves. I never said any such thing. Wanted no such thing. But I was back into a corner, you see? Oh. Pollen. Pollen in the air. So when he asked to make an appointment, I said, okay. I'm not one to pick up dates or clients in bars. Tubbs finished hanging the door and secured the lock. Amy and Juno watched as he dug around in his back pocket for something and produced a bent business card. I'm Leon Tubbs. I live a few miles away. I do the maintenance for all of Ed Shoop's buildings in town. If you have any more questions for me, uh, you can reach me at the number on that card. Ed Shoop, Ed Shoop owned a dozen buildings or so around town. He and his wife bought the properties 50 years ago when things were cheap. He was pretty old now. Tubbs was old enough to be Amy's father, but young enough to be Shoop's son, and acted as his right-hand man, doing building management for him as well as maintenance. Vera, Ed's wife, passed away just after Amy had moved in. They had waited until her 40s to try to have children, and, they, and the only one they had managed to produce had been born with severe de developmental and physical disabilities. Gretchen lived in a group home where she received 24-7 medical care. The only reason Amy knew this was because one of her clients happened to be a nursing assistant at the facility and told Amy once that while he paid the bills and frequently sent gifts, Ed only ever visited his daughter on Christmas Day, and the poor thing called him Santa, not Daddy. Tubbs extended, extended his hand, holding the card to Officer Juno, who took it and returned, uh, who took it and in return handed a business card to both Amy and Leon at the same time. Amy had never known Tubbs' first name. She only knew him as Tubbs, 
Leon didn't seem to fit. It sounded like a black name to her. Thank you, Mr. Tubbs, and if you have anything else to add or anything else happens in the next couple days, please don't hesitate to call me. Tubbs nodded, taking the card and tucking it in the breast pocket of his shirt. Will do. Thanks. Now I'm going to go home. Saturday's supposed to be my day off, Tubbs said over his shoulder as he lumbered off with his toolbox. Juno turned back to Amy. Do you keep notes on your clients, Amy? Other than contact info and credit card informo information for holding appointments? No, I'm not considered a medical practitioner, and I've never seen any reason to track what cards come up for people. Most folks only come to see me three or four times most, and my regulars tend to take their own notes. If you say so, I want a list of everyone you have seen for the past month, and there's a team on their way over right now to process the space for fingerprints. Maybe we can figure out who Mr. Musgrave's friend is. Are you able to email me the footage from your camera? Yes, I think I can do that. Then please do that. In the meantime, why don't you go get a bite to eat? By the time you're done, we will probably be finished over here. Amy wasn't feeling particularly hungry. I think I'll just wait in my car if you don't mind. Suit yourself, Juno told her. <sighs> this one's going to be interesting too, isn't it? Yeah. Couldn't go outside and do much when, when the fires were raging, even though, like, my property wasn't on fire. Oh, my God, my nose is so itchy. It's pollen. <sighs> I couldn't go outside. The ash was so thick in the air. It was hard to breathe. Mm -hmm. Nobody in my family ever called. Nobody ever called to inquire. Sometimes I wonder if they were just hoping I'd burn to death. Anyway. Another mystery is afoot. <laughs>